Welcome to City Church. City Church is a biblically based, relationally driven, spirit led church, encouraging everyone to follow Jesus and serve others. We're excited to share this sermon with you today, and you can always find out more about us online at citychurchseville.com. How many of you like to run? Look around, raise your hand really high if you like to run. And how many of you don't like to run? And how many of you, the closest you get to running is watching someone else run? There we go. We're going to be talking about running a race in just a moment. Um, But before we do that, the passage of Scripture that I'm going to be focusing on is actually taken from the Pursuit Daily Devotional that our City Church family is processing through over the next 21 days. We're kind of moving almost to midstream on that now. But if you did not pick up one of those devotionals, you can do that as you exit the sanctuary. They're available for you in the back. By the way, if you're worshiping home online and you haven't gotten one, you can swing by the city church office and we'll make sure that we we get you one. But the idea is, is as a church family, we're journeying together through this 21-day devotional of fasting and prayer. Now, as we talk about running together, or should I say growing together, I actually wore my running shoes in honor of uh, this, this morning's sermon. Do you see them? I really like them. They're really comfortable. I think they look cool, but I've never run in them yet. <laughs> I've walked a lot in them, but I don't run. I just, I'm done with running. Um, I used to be a a long-distance runner in the sense of competitively running 5Ks in high school and uh, really enjoyed running, but I came to recognize this simple fact my senior year in high school when I was on a cross-country team that was relatively successful, and I was kind of at the upper middle of the pack, by the way, was that uh, running's just pain tolerance. That's all it is. How much pain can you take? How many of you are runners and you know that that's true? It's literally just pain tolerance is all it is. And I figured that my dad raised a relatively smart guy, so why would I do that to myself? And I simply stopped running. Now, when it comes to the running experiences that I had, though, as I mentioned, I I did run cross-country. And the reason why I did was my older brother, Fred, was a cross-country runner. And I have to tell you, um, with great humility, I was much better than him (laughs) when it came to times. But what we're going to look at today is a text that's taken from the Pursuit Daily Devotional that we're using, and it's Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. And as I read that verse, as I've been reading ahead in the book, or in the Daily Devotional, as I read these four verses, I felt very convicted that in a very simple, practical way, I want to talk about running the race of faith. That's what I want to talk about. And so Hebrews 12, uh, chapter 12, verses 1 through 4, and let me give you the context. The letter to the book of Hebrews, we don't know who wrote it. We don't. Many people believe this is actually a sermon, that the whole book's a sermon. And it's written to a group of Jewish Christians who are deciding to give up. They've decided that they're thinking about no longer running the race. And this pastor, with incredible love, tries everything he can in order to get the people to continue to running. And chapter 12 is one of the things that he's using in order to encourage these people to stay in the race. Don't quit. Don't give up. It's relatively evident in the book of Hebrews that no one has been martyred yet, but it's coming. It's well on its way. That no one in that group has been martyred, but they know of others who have been. So can you imagine pastoring a group of people who are facing that, and at least already the confiscation of their property, and this pastor is encouraging them to run the race and to be faithful to Christ. Here's what the writer writes, Hebrews 12, 1 through 4. Therefore, Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, and again, this pastor is encouraging people to stay in the race. By such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Let us run 
with perseverance, the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him, meaning Jesus. Consider Jesus, who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. The first thing that we discover is that this pastor does something that's very unique and says to this group of people who are following Jesus, you are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Great cloud of witnesses. Just a moment, we're going to discover who those people are. But what I noticed in Scripture is that when you're surrounded, this is the only time it's a good thing. Every other time a person is being said to be surrounded, it's negative. Like in Judges 20, verse 5, where the judge writes, During the night the men of Gibeah came after me and surrounded the house, intending to kill me. It's a very unique concept that this is a unique time where there's an individual that's surrounded and it's positive. I can remember... When I ran cross country, it's very different than the races my wife runs now. So my wife, Fran, is training for her fourth 10-miler. She really loves me. That's why she never asked me to do it with her. And so this will be her fourth time running it, and she's in training with a very good friend. And so my part to play in that training is that when my kids were little, we would go to Bodo's on Preston, we would buy breakfast, and we would sit on the curb. And we would wrap a blanket around ourselves. And when Fran would run by, we would cheer. (laughs) Then we'd get in the car. We'd drive over to UVA. And when she was coming towards the chute, we would cheer again. It was exhausting. (laughs) Completely exhausting. Now, what's interesting to note, though, that the writer of Hebrews never mentions people that are alive. It's these dead people. These people that are found in the Older Testament that are the ones that are inspiring us. And so what we discover in Hebrews chapter 11 is what's called the Hall of Faith. That's the chapter just before what we read. And in there, the writer mentions people like Noah and Abraham and Moses. He mentions Rahab the prostitute, mentions all of these people who did things by faith, but all of them had one thing in common. And this is what he wants you to know, that all of them were looking over the horizon at something that was yet to come. Even though they had accomplished incredible things, they were looking over the horizon in faith at something that had not yet come. And so when we start Hebrews chapter 11, which is where the hall of faith is found, the first two verses of that chapter say this. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not yet see. This is what the ancients were commended for. It wasn't because Noah built a boat. It wasn't because Abraham heard from God. No, they were commended because they had confidence and assurance into something that was off in the future. That's what all of them had in common. All of them. Remember, faith has two things. Confidence and assurance. And what I discovered during COVID was these two became a challenge for me. Confidence and assurance. It's been a challenge. Here's why. COVID has had a way of revealing what and where we have put our confidence and our assurance. It's amazing how that's been laid bare. And so I know as a leader, I've confessed this many, many times, that COVID has been the most difficult time to lead. A lot of uncertainty. A lot of second guessing. But that's not how it should ever be for our faith. Our faith, because it's something in the future, can have a confidence and an assurance that literally can pull us into the future. 
That is what the writer of Hebrews is talking about. But until we get there, we have a race to run. That's what the writer's trying to teach us. And this race that we're called to run, at the outset, the writer tells us that we have to throw off certain things. There are certain things we need to get rid of if we're going to run well. Listen, I've got my running shoes on that are really walking shoes, but I have running shoes on. And the reason why you get geared up is if you're going to run, you wouldn't wear the dress shoes that I normally wear on a Sunday morning. There are certain logical things that you do in order to run well, and one of them is to get rid of excess weight. That had fascinated me. So I looked up and found the, an interesting fact that was scientifically studied. That is this. For people who run the half marathon, every 10 pounds of weight cut that they've had in their own physical body equates to six minutes of knocking off of time in the half marathon. So for every 10 pounds of weight cut, that equates to six minutes better in time. But not only does the writer tell us to throw off those things that weigh us down, but the sin that so easily entangles us. Isn't it interesting that the runner talks about sin that so easily entangles? Um, when I was running in high school, the, the course that we ran, I was running for Hopewell Valley High School. It's in Hopewell, New Jersey. The last two years of high school I actually spent in New Jersey. And so the team that I was running on at Hopewell Valley, we didn't have that huge of a schoolyard. It was pretty big, but it wasn't huge. And so in order to get 3.1 miles in, what they did every year was they would bush hog through this, it was basically a briar patch. And it was 12 feet wide, and they would bush hog this every year. And so this trail, if you looked at it from 30,000 feet or whatever, it would have kind of meandered through this briar patch, kind of gone through the woods, come back through the briar patch again, and then out into the ball fields, the athletic fields. So probably a third of the race was in the briar patch. Well, I was running, and uh, there were probably four guys in front of me, and you're running through this meandering bush hog trail through the, the briar patch, and there were about three or four guys in front of me, and someone about 30 to 40 feet in front of me while they were running, they went to turn one of the corners, and as they did, their wrist hooked into a briar bush that had been cut down and was all brittle and dry, and when it hooked their wrist, about half of that briar bush swung into the middle of the trail, and the guy right behind that person ran full speed with lightweight everything, just shorts, light as shirt you can, and ran straight into this briar. And it literally wrapped around them and entangled them. Now, being a Christian high school student, when I saw that, I prayed for them as I ran around them and just kept right on going, thinking, now that's someone I no longer need to compete against. That was a confession. <laughs> but the thing of it is, if you run and you get entangled, you don't finish. And the idea here is the writer of Hebrews is encouraging all of us who are on this race of faith to take sin seriously and to recognize that it entangles us. It keeps us from achieving what God calls us to do. The other thing the writer goes on to tell us, again, this is a very practical sermon, is that you gotta run the race. No one can do it for you. You have to run. Now, I remember on the team that I ran with, our two best runners, they ran together. They were like a duo. And running together made them faster and better. I talked about that last week, where having sisters and brothers in Christ helps us. It's interesting, though, that the writer of Hebrews never mentions that. But here these two runners were. They were our best two runners, and they would run together. And when we ran against teams where the times weren't as important or whatever, they had this habit that was kind of fascinating. What they would do is when the gun would go off, they'd let a good number of people get ahead of them. And one of the things that we had learned when you run is you need to have a song in your head. It helps you to keep pace. So they sang, Queen, Another One Bites the Dust. 
and they would get on either side of a runner, and as they passed them, they would sing that out loud. <laughs> Another one bites the dust. And they said it was awesome to turn around and watch the runner crumble, just literally lose steam because they would blow by on other side and be singing, another one bites the dust. I don't know why I shared that story other than I thought it was kind of cool. <laughs> now, the thing of it is though, is that the writer of Hebrews never talks about the effect we have on each other, ever. It's very fascinating. What the writer of Hebrews says is you have to run your race, your race, but you have to run it. No one can run it for you. It's a race of faith that I'm called to and that you're called to. And it's a biblical race in the sense of the next thing that the writer tells us is that we are to run the race that is marked out for us. And here's what's fascinating. This writer never mentions the time it takes to run. What the writer does mention is you have to run the course. It's not about how fast you finish. That's what motivates us, running against other people, running against the clock. But that's never mentioned by the writer of Hebrews. What the writer of Hebrews is concerned about is that you run the race and you run the race that Scripture marks out for us. When I was a runner... I ran in high school from 1988, oh, I'm sorry, 1978 to 1982. Those were the years I ran. And the most famous runner at that time was a woman, and her name was Rosie, and I think you pronounce her last name Vivas. It's V-I-V-A-S. You know what she was famous for? Winning the Boston Marathon. But she cheated. She never ran it. She started, 1980 Boston, she started running and then hopped on the subway. And she rode the subway, got off, ran a little bit more of the race and then hopped onto the subway again. And then she jumped off the subway and she came through at this time. But what was interesting is, eight days later, it was discovered she had not run the race. She never ran the race that was marked out for her. But isn't it amazing that during my time, she was the most famous runner alive. She cheated. She hadn't run the race that was marked out for her. But the scripture tells us that we are a group of people who are called to individually run the race that's there in front of us. The fastest runner I ever ran against in high school was a guy that came to Hopewell Valley High School and his goal was to break every course record that he ran on. He was actually recruited by Yale. He was gonna be running for Yale and my goal was to stick with him. The gun went off and I never saw him again. He literally just took off. He's an amazing runner. But what happened at Hopewell Valley course was he got off the course. He got lost. I don't know how it happened but he got lost and he, someone finally let him know and he doubled back and he figured out and he came back on the course. And what our coach told us was this, even if he had broken the course record, once you're off the course, it doesn't count. You have to stay on the course. That's part of the rules. I thought that's fascinating, isn't it? But God says, there's a course that you're called to run and it's a course of faith. You have to run it yourself you can't ride, run, ride on the subway. It's something you have to run. And staying on the course is what worries the writer of Hebrews, not the time it takes you to do it. It's about staying on the course. That's the writer's concern. So I would say it's important for us to know what Scripture says about faith. It's important to know what the Bible says about being a follower of Jesus and committing ourselves to staying on the course. The next thing that the writer mentions that is completely logical is about perseverance. The writer tells us that this race is one of perseverance. And it's very clear in the scriptures that every time a race of faith is mentioned, it's never a sprint. It's always a marathon. This is about 
the long haul. This is about truly being a person that runs the distance. And my question is to you. It's the same one the writer of Hebrews is addressing. Have you given up? Have you lost your perseverance? Have you stopped in the race? And are you standing still? That's what concerns the writer of Hebrews, and it concerns me. And it concerns me because there's something about this race that's for the long haul. And what's amazing is, is now we move towards feet to your faith. And what does it look like to take a look at Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 4, and actually run the race? The first thing that we notice is that the writer talks to those who are listening very intently about where you fix your eyes. The writer tells us very quickly and very succinctly that where you focus is what absolutely matters. What the writer says is when you run, you need to fix your eyes on Jesus. Now, I've got a little experiment I want us all to do. There's something about fixing your eyes that's important to know. What I want you to do is take your left hand and hold it six inches or less in front of your nose. Then I want you to take your right hand and hold it out as far as you can and line up the two. Now close your left eye. Now close your right eye. Which one lined it up? Which one lined it up? Real loud. Left or right? It's got to be one or the other. (laughs) Whichever one lined it up, that's which dominant eye you have. So if it was left, your left eye dominant. If you're right, your right eye dominant. Now, some of you are going, it didn't make any difference. And that means you're cross-eyed. That's what that means. So if you go like that. Now, what the writer of Hebrews teaches us is that we are to fix our eyes on Jesus. And if we feel like quitting, it's because we're looking in the wrong place. Isn't that fascinating? It's not that we've gotten burnt out or we've been at too fast a pace. The issue is where we fixed our eyes. That fascinates me. So here's what I know. I have been chatting with believers since COVID hit. And some of them have felt like quitting. And it's indicative of looking in the wrong place. Some, because of the politic, have felt like quitting their faith. Others have looked at the economy and felt like quitting their faith. Please know that you'll feel like quitting if you focused on the wrong thing. You're gonna feel like quitting. Because what we were told at the beginning is that whatever we do, it's going to take confidence and assurance And if we have lined ourselves up on something that isn't Jesus, that thing is going to let us down. Don't mix the two. Keep them separate. Keep our eyes on Jesus. And as we fix our eyes on Jesus and as we move towards closing, the writer of Hebrews tells us that the reason why we want to focus on Jesus is he's the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. That word pioneer is archagos in the Greek. I have a very dear friend of mine who wrote a book on immigration. And in this book, Dr. Joe Castleberry talks about what archagos actually means. Here in our scripture, it says pioneer. That's true. But it's much greater than that. Archagos was a Greek individual who was a leader. And that Greek leader went to colonize an area for the Greek world. And with them, their goal was to expand Greek culture as well as to bring Greek gods. It was all about colonizing and expanding the Greek reality. That's the word that's used of Jesus. He is our archagos. He has come into this world not just to be a pioneer, but to be a leader who can lead us. He knows where to go. He knows how to provide. He knows how to protect. He knows how to help us come in and establish the kingdom of God. He's our archagos. And the writer of Hebrews says, 
Focus on him. Because if you don't, you'll stop running. My final thought is the most memorable finish I ever had is a runner. Most memorable finish. When I was uh, running this race, I'll never forget it. I came through the chute. And when I came through the chute, it's always such a good feeling because the crowd is there and they're cheering and your form gets better. You try to pretend like you haven't been in agony for the last 15 minutes or whatever. And you just try to smile and look like this has been a breeze. And you're running through the chute and they shout out your time. And as I came through the chute, this is the most memorable finish I've ever had. A friend of mine named Paul, his dad was a real fan of ours, cheered us on. But he was standing at the edge of the end of the chute and he was smoking. And I ran through the chute totally exhausted and I breathed in all of that smoke. And I thought I was going to die. That's the most memorable finish I've ever had in running. It's a true story. But here's what I can promise you. If you run the race of faith, your most memorable finish will never disappoint you, ever. God will honor your race. People might not, culture might not, but if you are focused on Christ and you know in confidence and assurance that what lays over the horizon is God's best, it's God who will make all things new on that day. And that is what keeps you in the race. Your finish will be more mind-blowing and better than you could have ever dreamt. Would you stand with me as we close? As we close out our time, we're going to be worshiping Jesus in a moment. But as we prepare our hearts to close out in worship, whether you're here in the sanctuary or you're at home or wherever you're watching online, I would like for you, as we've all been worshiping together, whether online or in per person, I'm going to ask that you would close your eyes just for a moment. Two things. First, have you stopped running? The writer says there's one of two reasons. One of them, there's a sin that's entangled. If that's true for you, take a moment in faith right now with Jesus and untangle it. Confess, repent, and ask for forgiveness. For others of us, we've stopped running because we have not fixed our eyes on Jesus. Our eyes have been on the economy or the politic or someone who's offended me or whatever the case may be. What I want to encourage you to do right now is get your focus back on Jesus. He is the archagos. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. Keep your focus on him. The last thought that I have about this is I know that in recent years, some of the heroes of the Christian faith have let us down. We should never have Christian heroes to begin with. It's a contradiction in scripture. We have one hero. His name's Jesus. We do have people that encourage us, that teach us, that lead us, that's all true. But they're never to be our heroes. Jesus and Jesus alone is the hero of our faith. And we choose to focus on him.